first chapter. We're going to read today verses 29 through 36. John, the first chapter, verses 29 through 36. Those who are able today stand in honor of the reading of God's word. And the King James text today reads... The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Behold the Lamb of God. I want to talk to us today for a little while on the topic. He could have passed. He could have passed. Will you bow your heads with me one more moment? Master of the universe, creator of all mankind, savior of all who will believe and trust this wonderful gospel message. We come before you today humbly, God understanding that the preaching of the word is more than a human exercise. It is in fact today a divine operation. Lord, if it is done right, if the messenger of the gospel receives a word from you and then carries that message to the people of God, then, Lord, we're able to receive a word that heals, that saves, that delivers, that helps, that offers hope in hopeless times. And, Master, today I stand before you humbly acknowledging that outside of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, I surely can do nothing, can say nothing that would benefit and help the people of God today. Master, you've placed a word in my spirit. I'm so glad, God, that no matter how tired I feel, no matter how sick my body might be, no matter how much I struggle with my flesh, that the Spirit always wins. And you always give me a word that I'm able to get excited about. Because it is in fact a word from heaven that is able to bring blessing and help and encouragement and lighten and inspiration to the people of God. Touch me in body, touch me in mind, touch me in spirit that I in turn might be a blessing and a help to your people. Lord, today anoint every ear that would hear this word today. Those in this room, those watching by reason of the internet, the many, many, many who will later watch by reason of the internet. Let the anointing today carry this word upon swift wings, not only to our hearing, but also to our heart, that it might perform the work for which it is sent. We ask it all today in that blessed, wonderful, saving name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. I have to do something real quick that I hate to do, but I have to do. 
I take this very seriously. Last week I misspoke during the course of my message. Nothing irritates me worse than misspeaking. And it, it really bothers me. I'm, I'm serious. Now it's one thing if you're preaching, Lisa. We, you know, God reminds us we're human when we say, and, and Jonah built the ark and Moses got swallowed by the whale. Every preacher I know has used the wrong name at times, you know, in the wrong story. We do that on occasion, you know. Or sometimes we're talking about God and, and we're talking about his people and we'll say, you know, well, he's our child rather than we're his child. You know, those are minor missteps and misspeaks. But it's something entirely different when you say something that is just really kind of off the mark. And last week I said something during my message and I, and I, I told you I watch our messages online and I picked it up and I said, oh, Lord, Tommy can tell you, I was so embarrassed. I Last week I was talking about the Lord being conceived in the sixth month, and I said, now that's not December in anybody's calendar. Well, dummy, he was conceived in the sixth month. He wasn't born in the sixth month, number one. But number two, what I really was trying to say, but my brain was kind of probably because I was on the wrong drugs and, you know, all this other stuff. But what I meant to say was he was conceived in the sixth month, which is the month of redemption. Jesus was conceived in the month of redemption. Hallelujah. Now, if you add nine months to six, the sixth month, you come to the third month of the following year. Am I telling the truth? So even <coughs> if the Lord were conceived in the sixth month, according to the Gregorian calendar, which is the one we use today, even if the Lord were conceived in the sixth month, that would have made his birth in March, not in December. However, this is not going by the Gregorian calendar. This is going by the Hebrew calendar. The Hebrew calendar, listen, is far more complex than the Gregorian calendar, the Gregorian. Gregorian calendar. I'm going to say it right if it kills me. The Hebrew calendar is much more complex than that calendar we use today, okay? Their days do not even consist of 24 hours. Did you know that? No, because the Hebrew calendar goes by the moon cycles, not the sun cycles. So the, the calendar we use today is based on the notion that it takes 24 hours for the earth to travel around the sun. And that's why we have sun up and we have sun down, okay? However, the calendar used by the Hebrews that God gave them to use goes by the cycle of the moon. And the moon doesn't cycle the same way that the sun does. And as a matter of fact, for many centuries, do you know how they determined what month they were in and when they were going into the next month? The Sanhedrin used to have to make that determination. Can you imagine? In other words, they couldn't even say officially we were in the next month until the religious council that oversaw Judaism made that determination based on the cycles of the moon. So it's a very complex, it's a very different calendar. And according to the Hebrew calendar, if the Lord was conceived in the sixth month, which is the time of redemption, then he would have been born in the third month following, you know, not nine months from that month is going to be through the end of the year into the third month. And that would put the Lord being born somewhere in the neighborhood of fall, somewhere around August to early September, somewhere in there. Because Hebrew months do not work the way our months work. They literally are sim more similar to the zodiac. You know how the zodiac is... It's half of one month, and it goes into half of the next month. That's how the lunar cycle works, and that is why the Hebrew calendar is set. So I misspoke last week, and I said something about, you know, this is the sixth month. He was, you know, he's conceived in the sixth month. That's not December. Well, of course it's not December. That's not what we're trying to figure out. <laughs> we're trying to figure out when he was born, not when he was conceived. So anyway, does that solve that? Have we got that fixed? Okay. Just want to make sure we got that correct. In our primary text today, we're talking about he could have passed. 
We read about a famous occurrence. Many of us are familiar with this. If you know anything about the Word of God, you're familiar with the story of Jesus coming to John to be baptized by John in the River Jordan. And we've all heard the story of the dove that comes floating down and lands upon the Lord. And the people see this and they hear a voice says, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Oh, everybody's familiar with the story. And guess what? 99.999% of us have a completely wrong understanding of it. How do you like that? Say, Pastor, here you go again. <laughs> Folks, I'm telling you, this ain't hard. If you, if you know how to read and you let something say what it says, one of the first arguments people will use against the oneness of God and to try to support the doctrine of the Trinity is at <coughs> Jesus' baptism, all three members of the Trinity were present. God the Father was in heaven, God the Son was on earth being baptized, and the Holy Ghost separately and individually was represented as a dove coming down from heaven. Isn't that what you've heard when you're growing up in church? Isn't that what you heard? The whole Trinity is represented in the baptism of Jesus. Well, the only problem with that scenario is, first of all, God spoke to John and said, Upon whom ye shall see the Spirit of the Lord descending like a dove and lighting upon him. This is the one. You see, God had established a sign with John the Baptist so that John the Baptist would know who the Messiah was when the Messiah appeared. Now on this day as Jesus was coming, John makes the declaration, Behold the Lamb! Behold the lamb. I don't see a lamb. I see a man. What are you talking about? Behold the lamb. I don't see a lamb. I see a human being. What in the world is this guy talking about? He was talking about the Lord's true identity. He was talking about the Lord's true purpose in coming. He had come to be a sacrifice. Do you know, according to Jewish law, that one man cannot pay for another man's sins? According to the Hebrew law, no man can pay for another man's sins. Each man must render for his, for his own sin. No human being can pay for your sin. Even a father, the law said, could not pay for the sins of his child, nor could a child pay for the sins of the father. Every individual is responsible for themselves. This is one reason why, folks, listen to me now. This is one reason why Jews reject the doctrine of Christ. Because they say it's impossible for him to have died for anyone's sin. Because the law says that a man cannot die for the sins of another. Well, see, that's the problem. He was more than a man. If he wasn't more than a man, then his death meant nothing. Absolutely nothing. My Jehovah's Witness friend who wants to believe that God took old uh, uh, angel Michael and turned him into a man and that he was nothing more than a man. He was an angel become a man and he died on the spike and he died on the, because they don't believe in the cross. They don't believe in the Roman cross with the cross piece. No, it's just a pillar that stood there and they crucified him to the pillar according to Jehovah's Witness belief. If he was just a man that God created, then his death meant absolutely nothing. That is according to the law that God himself established. God don't break his own rules, folks. God said no man can pay for the sin of another man. No, he had to be something more than merely a human being. John looked and said, <coughs> Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins 
of the world. John saw and understood something about Jesus that nobody else in that crowd understood. He understood that this was not merely a man. This was the sacrifice that God had provided for all of humanity from the foundation, from the beginning of the world. God did not respond, Martin, to Adam's fall. He did not respond to Adam disobeying him and create a means of salvation. No, 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 no. It was all part of the plan from the get-go. Before Adam ever breathed his first breath, God already had a plan in place. He said, Adam is going to fail. Adam is going to disobey me. That's fine because it's all part of the plan. And I have already spoken the word. I have already voiced my plan. The angels have already heard me say, I will go and save them. Hallelujah. I will go and I will be their savior. The angels had already heard that word. And then when the perfect time had come, God's word, his plan, his spoken word became flesh and dwelt among us. God's plan became flesh. And that plan was with God from the beginning. That plan was with God. And that plan was God. God was in that plan. He wasn't planning on sending somebody else. He wasn't planning. No, because in order for that sacrifice, Martin, to mean anything, it had to be something more than a human being had to be something that god himself had provided hallelujah aren't you glad for that today when we look in the old testament we read the story in genesis 22 verses 6 through 8 and abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon isaac his son and he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father! And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, meaning Isaac, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? for the burnt offering. And Abraham said, My son, listen, God will provide My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both went both of them together. God had asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. This is the same son that God had promised to Abraham. This is the same son who was born in Abraham's old age. And God attached a number of promises to Isaac. He said through Isaac, through the seed of Isaac, all the nations of the world will be blessed. He said, through Isaac, your family, your lineage will number as the sands of the sea. And all of a sudden, God is asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac on an altar. My goodness. And God, help us, but Abraham was willing to do it. He was willing because he knew God keeps his word. He knew God is a God who keeps his word. And he knew when, it, when Isaac looked around and he said, Now, Daddy, wait a minute. There, I'm, I'm looking at the supplies we need to offer the Lord a sacrifice. And I'm seeing the wood. And I see the torch with the fire on it. But what I don't see is the lamb. Where is the lamb that we're going to offer in sacrifice? Now Abraham could easily have looked at him and said, Son, God's asked me to sacrifice you. You will be the sacrifice. But he didn't. 
No, Abraham understood God better than that. He understood there is no way in the world God is going to ask me to sacrifice Isaac because of all the promises he has made attached to Isaac. Even if he gave me another child, that would be God breaking his promise because he said through Isaac all the nations will be blessed. Through Isaac that my... my uh, and those that come after me will number as the sands of the sea. So God knew, no, no, this boy is unique. Listen to me now. Oh, I hope you hear me. There is a type here of salvation through Jesus Christ. This boy is unique. This boy is irreplaceable. And the only way this boy could be offered in sacrifice... God would have to raise him from the dead afterwards. Because he's going to keep his promise. Are you hearing me now? But Abraham looks at that boy and he says to him, knowing that God is a God who keeps his word, he looks at Isaac and he said, Isaac, son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Notice he didn't put it in this fashion. God himself will provide a sacrifice, which implies that God will do it by himself. He will do it himself. He will provide the sacrifice himself. No, he worded it. God will provide himself a sacrifice. That's different. That says that God will himself become the sacrifice. Oh my goodness. God will provide himself the sacrifice. What was Abraham saying? He said, son, before God is going to break his promise, before God is going to ask me to follow through on something that he has promised me uh, concerning you, he will sooner put himself on that altar than he'll ask, oh, hallelujah to God. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? And then when we get to that place of sacrifice, Abraham begins to think, well, maybe... <coughs> Maybe the Lord's going to make me follow through on this. Maybe he's going to raise Isaac up once I've killed him. He builds the altar of stone. He puts the wood atop it. He asks his son to lie upon the wood. And that son trusts him. And then he raises his knife high in the air, prepared to plunge it into his only son's heart, his only son, his unique son. His irreplaceable son. Does that sound anything like the Savior? Unique, irreplaceable, only. Hello now. All of a sudden, the voice of the angel of God cries out, says, Abraham, do your son, don't do Isaac any harm. He said, turn your head to the right. <coughs> and, and Abraham looks, and there in the bushes, tangled up in his horns, is a lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God provided the lamb. God provided the lamb. He said you were willing to make that sacrifice. That was a type of the sacrifice that God himself made on our behalf. He had a unique son, an irreplaceable son, a son of promise. The Messiah came with all kinds of promise. And one of the promises was what, what God said to David. David said, The Lord hath sworn unto his servant David, and he shall not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I sit upon thy throne. So that promised one, that Isaac, that Jesus was, he was unique, he was irreplaceable, he was promised. And what was promised? It was promised that he'd be God himself. Hallelujah. The Old Testament prophet said his name shall be called Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Hallelujah. Are you following me so far? All right. He could have passed. When I first came out back in the late 80s, 
I had to learn a whole new bunch of terms, a whole new bunch of lingo. You know, when you come out into the community, Martin, you hear all the, and I don't want to use half the terms, I, you know, just to be, it, it, you know, I don't want some, honestly, folks, I try to say things, if you wonder why I say things the way I say things, I don't want somebody who's listening to us who is not part of the LGBT experience and part of the LGBT community, I don't want them to turn us off and not listen to us because they're offended by my choice of words. Do you follow what I'm saying? So I try to word things in a way sometimes because I want them to hear what I'm saying. And if I'm not careful, they're going to say, oh, I can't believe he said top, or I can't believe he said this or that. Do you follow what I'm saying? So, and, and they get offended at a word, and then they don't listen to the rest of the message. I don't want that to happen. I want them to hear everything I'm saying. But there are terms, I just used one to give you an idea, that all of a sudden, I had to learn because I didn't know nothing about all these different terms. I didn't know nothing about all. And one of the, the people that I've had a long-term relationship with, Jason, uh, he was younger than I, kind of like Tommy. He was a good deal younger than I. And he had all these terms down pat. Boy, he knew all these terms. And I mean, he, he would tell me, he'd educate me. Well, this is what this means. That's what that means. And one of the terms that he introduced me to was passable. That individual is passable. Now, passable can refer to a gay or lesbian individual who looks enough like the norm, looks enough like the stereotypical man or woman is supposed to so-called look or act or carry themselves so that you would not know at a glance that they were gay or lesbian. But they also use the term passable on people like drag queens and transgender, transsexual people who look with the eye, they, it, when you look at them with the naked eye, they look very much like what they're trying to present themselves as and you wouldn't really have any clue in the world. In other words, you look at a man who performs as a woman, and you wouldn't know, Johnny, to look at him, that they weren't a woman. And it is said of someone like this that they could pass, that they are passable. Why, my Lord, you look so much like a woman, Frank, that you're passable. You could go and you could literally walk the streets and nobody would have a clue that you're not a woman. Do you understand what I'm saying? He could have passed. Jesus could have passed. What do I mean by that? He could have passed as a man. Because everything that people saw with their naked eye was human. Everything people saw with their naked eye was flesh and bone. Nobody saw a lamb. Oh, hallelujah. Except for John. <laughs> Nobody understood who he really was. And what his real purpose in coming was. Except for John. And John declared... Behold the Lamb of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. He could have had everybody else didn't get it, but John got it. Now notice the word of God says that John said, He that sent me to baptize. Now how many of us in this room believe that John originated in heaven? None of us. No, John didn't originate in heaven. He was a man born of natural parents, just like anybody else. He, yet it is said that he was sent by God. Read the first part of John chapter 1. And it says, and there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Doesn't mean that God had him up there in heaven in front of him. It just means that God put a calling on his life and gave him a mission in life. This is why the word of God says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son 
into the world, not unto, but into the world, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So when you say somebody that God sent the Son does not mean that as the Son he existed in heaven. Do you follow what I'm saying? Any more than it means when God sent John, that John originated in heaven. But now here's another little interesting spot about this story we read in our primary text today. God had made... He had given John a little foreknowledge. He said, when you see the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon a man, you will know this is the Messiah. I'm just going to tell you real plain today. I, I, I can't drag it out. I'm running out of breath already. The only person at the Jordan River who saw that dove and heard that voice was John. Nobody else. Nobody else. Say, Pastor, I don't believe that. Why, I grew up in the Lutheran church, and they told me that everybody in the audience saw it. Um, let's read our Bible, if we would. <laughs> let's let the Word of God say what it says. Listen to me now. Verse 34, John 1. And I saw. And bear record that this is the Son of God. Well, let's go back to John 30, uh, 1, 32. And John bear record, saying, what does that mean, bear record? It means he testified to the fact. He, he testified to something, okay? Here's what John testified to, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. Well, why would John have to bear record? Why would he have to testify to that if everybody else saw it? Hello now. Why did he not say, we saw? No, he said, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And it abode upon him. Well, John, you're testifying to something we all saw. No, no. That's the problem. He alone saw it. Now listen to verse 33. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with water. The Holy Ghost. So this was a contract God had made with John. So that John would know who the Messiah was. Are you following me? Yeah. So what happened the day the Lord was baptized, God gave John a divine vision. Are you following me now? To confirm to John what God had told John was going to happen when the Messiah appeared. And then it goes on to say, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Got news for you. Three out of the four Gospels all say the identical same thing. That John saw and John bear record. Are you following me now? What have I told you the Word of God said? Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So everybody in the room, everybody at the Jordan River did not see this transpire. God did not want the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ to be based upon a voice coming out of heaven. Hello now. No. He was doing something that he had told John he would do so that John would know. And then it was John's responsibility at that point to bear record and to testify and to tell people, God told me that I would see this when the Messiah was in front of me. And guess what? I saw it. Are you following what I'm telling you today? Now, is that a major doctrinal point? No. But a lot of people, Lisa, get a lot of thoughts about that particular passage, and their thoughts are based on a wrong understanding of the passage to begin with. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Amen. 
He could have passed. People saw a man. Jesus was a man. John saw a lamb. Hallelujah. People saw a man. John saw a lamb. Not only did he see a lamb, but he saw a lamb who met the criteria of Abraham's prophetic words in Genesis 22 and verse 8. God will provide himself a lamb. Hallelujah. In Isaiah 53 verses 6 and 7, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. We understand today that Isaiah in Isaiah 53 is talking about the Messiah. That is a prophecy concerning the Messiah. And he likens the Messiah to a lamb. Am I telling the truth now? But wait a minute. Jesus is the lamb of God. But Jesus also said... <laughs> I am the good shepherd and my sheep ooh, <laughs> I'm going to get Pentecostal on y'all for a minute <laughs> see this might not excite you as much as it excites me but man does it excite me I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd layeth down his life for the sheep Mm. Oh, we, mm. glory to God. Not only was he the lamb, but he was also the shepherd. <laughs> oh, my God, have mercy. Let me tell you, when he spoke the words, I am the good shepherd, he committed blasphemy, according to Jewish teaching. First of all, you remember what happened when a man came to Jesus and said, Good master! Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And before the Lord even answered his question, he said, Why dost thou call me good? I'm good, but who? But God. Why do you call me good? There is none good but God. And then Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Oh my goodness. And the sheep know my voice. He's committing blasphemy. First of all, there's none good but God. Secondly, there is no shepherd over Israel but God. There is no shepherd over Israel but God. Read your Bible, folks. Read your Bible. Psalm 23. <laughs> the Lord, Jehovah, is my shepherd. <laughs> I shall not want. Hallelujah. The Lord. And then Jesus comes and said, they're none good but God. I am the good shepherd. Hallelujah. Two points that refer to his deity. Two items, Johnny, that point to his divinity. Two things that point to the fact that this is the Lamb. That God has promised he would provide. Oh, he could have passed. Because all people could see was his flesh. People read the New Testament. And you get all these doctrines and all this teaching. People don't want to understand the divinity of Christ. Because they forget. The people doing the writing are writing from the perspective of men and women who saw Jesus as a man. When Peter preached the Pentecost, men and brethren, Jesus Christ, a man approved of God. That does not mean, Tommy, that he was nothing more than a man. 
But it means that the people that Peter was preaching to on the day of Pentecost who were in Jerusalem for the celebration of the Feast of Pentecost had known Jesus. They had seen Jesus. And what's Peter going to do? Get up and say, men and brethren, I got news for you. Jesus was God. No, he said, men and brethren. A man approved among you. That's all they saw. That's all they understood. They didn't see a Lamb of God. They saw a man of God. Hello now. When Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, he said, Rabbi, we know that thou art sent from God. We know that God has anointed you and sent you on a mission. For no man could do these miracles except God be with him. That does not mean, Tommy, that he was only a man. That means that's what Nicodemus saw. That's as far as Nicodemus' eyes could go. But isn't it funny? Because listen to what Nicodemus said. I mean, what Jesus said to Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus... And why he would say this, Nicodemus didn't ask him, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to enter into the kingdom of God? No, Nicodemus came and said, no man can do these miracles, except God be with him. And all of a sudden, Jesus looks at him and says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, listen to me, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So you come to me saying, you have to be somebody special as a man because God's with you. And Jesus turns around and said, unless you're born again, you can never see, see, see the kingdom of God. You see, you can't see anything more than a man in me. In order to see anything more than a man in me, you must be born again. Are you understanding me today? If you're going to get into the kingdom, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you're going to get in, you've got to go through Jesus. If you're going to go through Jesus, you've got to be born again so you know who Jesus really is. Because he was more than a man walking to John on the beach of the Jordan River, on the banks of the Jordan River. No, he was more than a man of God. He was the Lamb of God. He was the provision of God for sacrifice that would take away the sins of the world. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, the word of God reads, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. Look at the language used in Mark 8, 31. And be killed. Didn't say and die. Said and be killed. Now look at Luke chapter 22, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover... <laughs> Must be killed. <laughs> Jesus was God's provided Passover lamb. The lamb had to be killed. <laughs> and Jesus told his disciples, I've got to go into Jerusalem and I must be killed. Why? Because I'm the Passover lamb. And the Passover lamb must be be killed. Hallelujah! Don't that set a fire underneath you a little bit. Amen. I know some of y'all still got that old Baptist blood boiling up in your veins. I know. We'll, we'll get it boiled out eventually. I'm going to get you to the point where you shout about this because it's worthy of shouting. Revelation chapter 5, the entire chapter. It's 14 verses. Listen now. I'm going to try to bring this message to a close. He could have passed. A lot of people, they see that drag queen, they see that transgendered person, and all they see is the woman or the man that they can discern with their naked eye. They don't know anything about that person's history. They don't understand that person's real life experience and who they are in the flesh, they don't understand that because all they can go by, Johnny, is what they see. 
Jesus could have passed, but listen in Revelation 5. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within <coughs> and on the backside sealed with seven seals. That's why we sing. When we sing, I've got the Holy Ghost that said John wrote about him in the book of the seven seals. <coughs> And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? <coughs> Listen. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, oh, hallelujah, no man in heaven, or in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look therein or thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. <laughs> Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, In the midst of the throne, verse 6, Revelation 5, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayer of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and, tw and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth 
forever and ever. Where did the Lamb come from? From the midst of the throne. <laughs> John said in our primary text today, this is the one I told you about who is preferred before me. Listen. Because he was before me. Wait a minute, John. You must have misunderstood something. The angel came to Mary and told Mary that her cousin Elizabeth was already pregnant with you. You were already conceived, John. You were six months older than Jesus, not younger. How did he come before you? How was he before you? Well, when the scribes and Pharisees were asking Jesus, how do you know Abraham? You're not even 50 years old. What did Jesus say? He said, before Abraham was, I am. Hallelujah. When you understand who I am, when you understand I'm the Lamb of God that proceedeth out of the throne of God, I am the heart of God manifested as a Lamb. Oh my God, have mercy. And the Word of God tells us in the book of Revelation, there is one throne in heaven, and there is one that sits upon that throne. And yet that throne, listen to me children, is called the throne of God and of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Don't that make you want to get Pentecostal a little bit and shout? <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. He could have passed. A lot of people today, Jesus is still passing. A lot of people today, they're still seeing him as a man. They're still misunderstanding his true identity. Because, honey, in order to understand who Jesus is, you must be born again. Until you're born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. And if Jesus is the way to the kingdom, and you can't get to God outside of Jesus, then I've got news for you. You can't see Jesus. You can't understand who he is until God quickens your mind and allows you to see and understand. He is that wonderful blessed sacrifice that God promised would come. A sacrifice that would consist of no man. When they searched through heaven and earth and below the earth and they looked for a man to open the book with the seven seals, what does the word of God tell us? There was no man. There was no man that could open the book. Not on earth, not in heaven, not in hell. There was no man. Oh, but then the lamb came out from the midst of the throne. Oh, hallelujah. Are you all getting this? Yeah. Are you under, you want to know why we're a one God, Jesus name, apostolic tongue talking, baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, preaching Acts 2.38 church? This is why. Because Jesus could have passed. Many could see him only as a man. But John said, no. Don't let appearances fool you. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Not just the sins of Israel. How could that sacrifice be sufficient to literally pay for the sins <coughs> Of all lost humanity, it's because of who that sacrifice was. If that sacrifice had been a man, wouldn't have paid for a single person. Amen. But because that sacrifice was God, because God, as Abraham said, provided himself a sacrifice, it was able to pay for the sins of the world. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm going to have you remain seated for a moment. I'm going to. There's a wonderful old chorus. I hope I've still. I hope I didn't X out. Because I have a habit of doing the wrong thing sometimes. Amen. Here we go. I want us to sing this little song today. As we close this service. 
This is an old Darby Rambo song that says, Behold the Lamb, hallelujah. Jesus is. Amen. He is the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Sister Lisa, honey, if you'll come. Kind of